What's good? It's me talking to a camera again. What is up? Beautiful and intelligent people of the internet. And if you don't think you're either of those things, I'm here to tell you, you are. Really, you're mistaken. You are beautiful and you are intelligent. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. On the other side of that screen, I'm talking to you. Okay. We're going to be doing the forces incline question. This will be a question involving forces and an incline slope. We'll have things, we'll be introducing you to friction and stuff like that. And, you know, I've made this worksheet and that's a banger. Don't want to toot my own horn, but it's a banger. So from 2019 to 2021, you have all of these uh, incline force questions and I've answered them all for you. We'll be going through three really good examples in this video. And what do you need to know? Well, you need to know the incline geometry and how the weight is distributed the same at the same angle as uh, the incline slope. <clears throat> we'll get familiar with that when we start the questions. You need to understand frictional force and all frictional force is, it's just a force which acts in the opposite direction to the motion of an object when it's in contact with a surface. And that is equal to the coefficient of friction, which is to do with the surface itself. This will be between zero and one. Zero if it's a completely smooth surface and, you know, 0 0.999 if it's really, really rough surface. So it's high friction. And the normal contact force, which is the force which is perpendicular to the plane or the incline in which uh, the object is, you know, kind of weighing down on, which makes sense, you know, pushing down and then plus the frictional force. Well, if you push down harder, it's going to be harder to move. Um, <clears throat> not going to talk about that, but you can look at that. It's to do with particles in equilibrium. We're going to do a question on that, which I'll explain it, where I'll explain it. And obviously you need to know uh, work done. And work done is just the force times the displacement. So work done by an object uh, and the force in the same di uh, direction as the displacement in which that object moves. We'll also do a question on that. And that's it. And so we're going to do questions to give you a feel for all the content and all the understanding you need. And this pops up a lot. So, and it pops up in all different kinds of questions. You know, so this is a good starting point for us as we move forward, deconstructing this mechanics exam. Okay, let's do some questions. A particle of mass, 13 kilograms, is on a rough plane incline at an angle of theta to the horizontal. So let's start drawing this out. So we have, oh God. Here we go. And I like to keep everything in general form. You can see what I mean by that. So it's at theta. And we have a particle. And the mass of this particle is 13 kgs. And we have the weight, which acts straight down. And this is distributed like in, on the content of the worksheet, the same angle as this incline. You should always draw that out. Um, the frictional coefficient is 0 0.3. I feel like I should go a little thinner here. The frictional coefficient is 0 0.3. And uh, the force so Tn is acting parallel to the line of the great slope, greatest slope. So we've got this force T. The particle moves, so it moves distance S, which is uh, 2.5 meters. It's up the plane at a constant speed, find the work done. Well, work done equals to force, or in this case T, work done, so constant plane, find the work done by this force T. So it'd be T times S, our displacement. Well, we need to find T because we already have S. And what is T? Well, we need to resolve the forces acting up and down this plane. So we can say T, which acts up, T. So it's moving at a constant speed. So the resultant force is going to be zero because the result of all this will be zero 
because it's moving at a constant speed, so which means it's not accelerating. You, know, you can have something moving at a constant speed and you have no resultant force on it. When a resultant force is applied on it, well, the speed will change because it will begin to accelerate. So the resultant force of all of these forces added together here is going to equal to zero. And that will allow us to set up an equation for T and find it. So T plus, oh no, T minus the frictional force. Why is it minus? Because it'll be acting down the slope. The frictional force will be acting down the slope because T is acting up the slope. And it's moving at a constant speed up the slope. So it's moving up and the frictional force acts in the opposite direction as, t as, uh, as the motion. Uh, and then also minus Wx, which is the x component here of this weight, which is distributed down the slope. Now it's not W, Wx, because that's the weight which is distributed down the slope. And we're resolving what, um, you know, the forces up and down the slope. And all of that will equal to zero because there's no other forces involved up and down the slope. Okay, so therefore T equals to F mu plus Wx. What is F mu? Well, F mu is our frictional force, which is mu, coefficient of friction, times our normal force. And this, or Wx, is going to be, you know, W, so opposite over hypotenuse, so sine theta equals wx over w so therefore wx equals and i won't do this every time but this is where it comes from wx equals w sine theta so this equals to w sine theta therefore t equals to mu times r and what is r r is that normal contact force so it's the force which is pushing down perpendicular to this inclined plane and that's going to be this wy right that's the only force which is perpendicular to that inclined plane so this r is going to be wy plus w sine theta and wy well this is just going to be the same thing here but you know, it's going to be cos theta equals wy over w, which means wy equals w cos theta. So mu equals w cos theta um, plus w sine theta. You can factor out a w here if you like to make it look nicer. Cos theta plus sine theta. T. And so I keep it in this general form. And so finally, therefore, a work done by this T will equal to this, which is W mu cos theta plus sine theta uh, times S. All right. And then all you do, because we have all these values here, you just plug them all in. So this is going to equal to, well, the weight is going to be our mass times gravity, which is 10. So it'd be 130 newtons. 130 newtons. And this is mg. 130 newtons. Mu is 0 0.3. Oz of uh, our theta was, what was our theta? So 10 theta equals to 5 over 12. So that, you know, our theta will be the inverse of this. And that'll be a specific degrees, but you can just plug that into your calculator and chuck it in here. Oh, maybe I'll do that for you. So shift 10 of, but I'd recommend you keep it in answer so you can get it exact. So, you know, shift the theta will be 22 point, you know, six, six, two dot 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 because it's an irrational number plus sine of 22.62 dot 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 I'm just substituting everything here times our displacement which is 2.5 and so if you plug that all into your calculator so 0 0.3 cos of answer plus sine of answer is that 
times 130 times 2.5 is 250 joules. So therefore the work done by the force T is 215 joules. So that gives you a taste of how they can get you to ask on work done with these incline um, force questions. Okay. I may mess up a lot, a lot of space here. Okay, a particle of mass 2.5 kg. So I'm going to redraw this. I always redraw these things poorly on this computer, but that's all right. And I'm writing it in a general form. So theta. So we're going to have two thetas here. Theta 1. And we have this particle which acts up and this is going to be, I'm going to call it theta two. This is T. So we have theta one equals to 20 degrees. Theta two equals to 60 degrees. Um, the mass is 2.5 kgs. And we have to put our weight in again. This will be, this is theta one. Uh, what else? And mu is 0 0.3. So our coefficient, friction coefficient. Find the greatest and least possible values of T. So this is an important question, which comes up a lot. So we need to figure out where is T. So it's, it's okay. So it's important that we know that it's holding it at equilibrium. So it's holding at a point where it's not moving. So it's, but T could be very large and it could be at the point of moving up the slope or T could be small and it would be at the point of falling down the slope, right? There's a, there's a range that T could hold where it would still be at equilibrium on the slope. So what will T be? So what is when T, so T is max. Well, when T is max, it's on the verge of moving up the slope. So when it's on the verge of moving up the slope, the frictional force will be acting down the slope because it's, it's pulling it up and that's going to be in the opposite direction. So T X, so the X component of T, again, we're resolving up and down the slope. So this X component of T minus the frictional force, which will be acting down the slope and then minus the weight, which will be acting down the slope, which is W X, right? T of X is this component of T, which acts up the slope. And WX is this component of W which acts down the slope and F mu will be acting in the opposite direction of T of X. And all of that, because it's at equilibrium, will equal zero. And that's where it will be at maximum. When it's at minimum, well, that means that when it's just about to fall down the slope. So that means when it's just about to fall down the slope, well, the frictional force will be acting up the slope, right? Because it's about to fall down. So it's acting, acting in the opposite direction of the motion. So that means that, you know, T of X plus F of mu, because T of X and F of mu are now both working in the same direction. Ooh, no. Right? We've got F of mu acting this way and T of X acting this way. And then obviously W of X will also will be acting down the slope. So now we have two equations for where T is at max and where T is at min. And you could just substitute everything in and figure this out and then, uh, you know, work them out individually. But I'm going to merge these two equations to make it quicker. T of X minus plus F of mu minus W of X equals zero, right? So the top one, T of X minus F of mu minus W of X. This is where it's at max. So that this is two equations in one. T of X plus F of mu minus W of X. This is where it's at min. Right now we figure out these things. So what is T of X? Well, T of X is going to be the X component of this, which will be uh, opposite adjacent. So it's going to be T times cos of theta two. Right. I don't want to have to keep doing this, but you know, it's like so cos of theta two equals adjacent, which is T of X, this component here. I mean, look at my resolving vectors video. We need more than this, that, and then you rearrange so T of X equals this. I'm not gonna keep doing that. So minus plus F of mu, we mu times R, R, normal force, and minus, and W, 
So the x is this, so that's going to be opposite. So it's going to be w sine of theta 1 equals 0. Okay, let's keep going. Cos of theta 2 minus plus mu. And what is r? Well, r is this contact normal force. And we have two things contributing to this contact normal force. We have the w y acting down and we have this t which is kind of pulling it up a little bit uh, acting ty here we have that also contributing to this contact result in contact normal force which is pushing down on the incline plane so it's going to be wy minus ty All right, i hope that makes sense see they're both contributing to this how much weight or force is pushing down on this incline plane you got T of Y or the Y component of T pulling it up and the a Y component of the weight pulling it down. And so the resultant of those two is the overall force applied on the incline plane. And minus W sine of theta one, zero. And so let's expand these all out. So minus plus mu, well, W Y will be W cos of theta one. And T of Y will be T of sine of theta 2. Which is worked out the same way as I worked these out. Okay, so let's continue expanding. So this is now just simplification. So T cos of theta 2. Let's expand this in because we're trying to get T equals. So we're going to get this minus plus times this will be minus plus mu w cos of theta 1 minus times a minus plus times a minus so this thing is going to switch around to plus minus uh, mu t sine of theta 2 and then minus w sine of theta 1. okay let's put t on this side so t cos of theta 2 plus minus mu t sine of theta 2 equals 2. If we take this over, we become positive. If we take this over, the minus will go to a plus, and the plus will go to a minus, so this will be plus minus mu w cos of theta 1. Factor out of t, cos of theta 2, plus or minus mu sine of theta 2 equals, we factor out of w, sine of theta 1 plus or minus mu cos of theta 1. So therefore t equals to uh, cos of the, oh no, will be w sine of theta 1 plus or minus mu cos of theta 1 divided by this, which is cos of theta 2, plus or minus mu sine of theta 2, right? So this, so sine theta plus mu cos theta and cos theta plus mu uh, sine theta will be when t is max and when t is min is the minusing one, right? Because this top equation was this and this bottom equation was this. And so you plug all these values in now. So 20, 60, I guess I could do it really quick. So therefore T equals, I just want to say one time, T equals two. Actually, you can do it. You can do it, right? You just plug all these different values in. You know, W will be 10 times. This is 25. I just don't want to make the videos too long. Right, so you plug all these things in. You have this. This is twenty degrees. This is uh, this is uh, sixty degrees. This is zero point three, and W will be twenty five. Right, so you plug all those things in, and you'll get for the pluses, you'll get a T max equal to twenty point five, and a T min will equal to six point two six, right, and that's your answers. So the T max is when it's just about to start moving forward up the slope and the T min is when it's just about to start falling down the slope. And that comes down to 
Well, if it's just about to go up the slope, well, then the friction is acting down the slope. And when it's just about to go down the slope, well, the friction is acting up the slope. And the sum of all those components is equal to zero because it's at equilibrium. So the resultant force is zero because it's not moving. Okay, and finally, we're going to do this one. So a block of mass, five kilograms, is placed on an incline. So you can see they're quite similar, all of them. So we have, let's start redrawing it. Nope. So theta, mass here, W, same thing, theta, theta, and then we have a force acting up, let's call it F, so let's write out these things, we have, you know, the mass is 5 kilograms, the force is equal to 40 newtons, and the theta is 30 degrees. Okay, and we want to show that mu is less than, this frictional force is less than or equal to 1 over 5 square root 3. Okay, so this force is applied and is acting up the plane parallel to the line. So exactly what I've shown, the block begins to slide up the plane. So I guess there's two ways you can think about it. If the block begins to slide up the plane, well then the resultant force up the plane is going to be greater than the frictional force, right? So the resultant force, like, I guess you could say F, resultant force up the plane, is going to be greater than the frictional force, right? Which will be acting down the plane. And what is this? Well, the resultant force up, acting up the plane will be F minus the weight, Wx. And that's going to be greater than F mu. Right? And you could also think about it, I guess, like, well, if it starts to move up the plane, well, then the resultant force, the sum of all these forces, like we did before, along the plane is going to be greater than zero because it's moving up the plane. So you could say that F, you know, minus F mu minus Wx, well, this is going to be greater than zero. And in fact, if you rearrange this, you get F minus F mu minus Wx is greater than zero. So you do get the same thing, but just two different ways to think about it, I guess. Okay, so then you figure this out. So F, so therefore, F minus F mu will be mu of R minus Wx will just be this component, which is W sine theta is greater than zero. And therefore, we get that F minus mu of R. And what is R? Well, the only thing acting, the only contact force is this weight Wy. And Wy is W cos theta times w cos theta minus w sine theta is greater than zero okay and then we want to rearrange for mu so we can take this over we get mu w cos theta is less than f minus w sine theta and therefore mu is less than f minus w sine theta over w was well theta right and let's sub all these things in so f was 40 w will be 50 so f is 40 minus 50 sine of 30 for sure is a half yep so sine of 30 is a half and then it's 50 times cos of 30 and they have their answer with a square root 3 in. So I'm going to put this in third form. So the cos of 30 degrees in third form is square root 3 over 2. Okay, so therefore we get mu is less than 40 minus 25 over 25 square root 3. That equals to what? 15 over 25 square root 3, which equals to 3 over 5? Yeah, 3 over 5 square root 3. That's not quite what they wanted. They want 1 over 5 square, times square root 3. So let's, so we have now that mu is less than 3 over 5 square root 3. Let's multiply this by square root 3 over square root 3. And that will give us to 3 square root 3 over 5. Square root 3 times square root 3 is 3 times 3. And all those 3s will cancel and we get 1 over 5. 
So therefore mu in the situation, the least value, the least possible value of mu. I mean the greatest in fact. We're showing this, yeah. Is one over is less than one over five square root three. Cool. And finally, this is another good example. It's giving you a different kind of way, a different scenario. So when the force of magnitude here is applied the vertical line and saying the block does not move, show that mu is this. Or the least possible value of mu is this. Well, let's draw this out. Always recommend drawing it out. And you get a pen and pad, so you can draw way better than me. Theta 1, we have this. I do it in general form you, because it makes it easier. I can create an equation at the end and then sub it all in. You know, in the, calculating everything individually with numbers may cause possibility for error. So we have this, I'm going to call it F acting here. And well, this angle here, right? This is the same as this. So this would be, we don't need to say, we can just take data. This would be the same as this, right? It's the same angle. It's the horizontal along the plane, horizontal along the plane. Uh, what else do they have? So we have F equals to 40 newtons the mass is 5 kgs and what else do we have here and theta is 30 degrees and i guess we should note that uh, what was it sine theta equals a half and cos theta equals in third form uh okay and so it wants us to find this the least possible value of mu So, well, it's a similar thinking as before. So, if it doesn't move, so we're pushing it, it doesn't move. Well, that means that the frictional force is greater than or equal to, because it doesn't move, so it could be zero. Greater than or equal to the resultant force up, up along the plane. So, F resultant. So, therefore, we get F mu is greater than or equal to well, it's greater than or equal to the F, the X component of F minus the weight of X. All right, and now we rearrange. Now we just substitute these things in. So mu of R is greater than or equal to F of X will be what opposite adjacent will be F cos of theta. And W of X, well, got to put that in, sorry. So W of X will be, this is theta, W of X will be minus W sine theta and mu of R, well R is contributed by the force WY plus the force of F of X, um, F of Y, because it's pushing it into the plane, all right, this is acting down, the previous one was acting up with T. And so that's why they minus each other. But this one is plus. And that is greater than or equal to F cos of theta minus W sine of theta. So mu WY will be W cos theta. And F of Y will be sine F sine theta. It's greater than or equal to F cos theta minus W sine theta. So therefore... You see how it could be it's easier with keeping it all in general form if you had a bunch of numbers in here it would be confusing i think minus w sine theta divided by w cos theta minus plus uh sine theta right and then if we plug all that stuff in we get mu is greater than well f was 40 and w is 50 so f is 40 remember cos of 30 was square root 3 over 2 minus 50 of a half over 50 times square root 3 over 2 plus f which is 40 sine theta see how much easier it is to do it like this 
So therefore we get mu is greater than or equal to, well, this would be 20, square root 3, uh, minus 25, divided by 50, divided by 2, but 25 square root 3, plus 20. And if you plug that in to your calculator, 20 minus 25, divided by 25, square root 3, 25 square root 3, plus 20. 0 0.152. So therefore, mu is greater than or equal to 0 0.152, which is what they wanted. Right? It says show that the least possible value, and they're showing it's this is the least possible value of mu. Okay, that's it. So you've got really good examples there that I went through. And you have the worksheet here. Where I've taken all of the questions. This took me a while to like organize this one, but I've taken all these questions and we're going to build upon this with this force question. You know, we're going to mix in energy next and power and stuff like that. But this is the basic sort of structure of this. And so you've got them all there from 20, 2021, 2020, and 2019. I answered all of them for you. It took me a while. And so when you do this, you're going to get a really good understanding of how to answer these questions. All right, that's it. Um, and now I'm going to talk about some of the ideas presented here. Live in accordance with nature is a quote by Marcus Aurelius, uh, an ancient Stoic, and you know he led the Roman Empire. Pretty, uh, pretty whacked out dude. I mean, his diary, his personal diary is like a bestseller two thousand years later. Which I mean, think about that. If you wrote some personal notes and then. 2,000 years from now, people are reading it like, wow, this is, wow, this is amazing. Anyway, live in accordance with nature. This is a kind of what I'm trying to get across here. It's a concept that the things that we observe in nature, we should live accordingly to. And so with this um, video, we were introduced to the idea of balance and equilibrium and things being balanced, basically. And I want you to try and conceive of maybe something inconceivable but uh, the balance of the universe. I mean, the universe is has a almost divine balance. I mean, let's think about it for a second. We're on um, Earth, it's rotating, we've got the moon going around, we've got a bunch of other planets all orbiting the sun, uh, it's all working in harmony, it's not like floating off into space, and then that solar system is one of probably billion solar systems in our galaxy, and that galaxy is one of a hundred billion, hundreds of billions, of galaxies in the observable universe and all of this is working in harmony in balance to uh, keep this system working and then let's think about just the earth nature itself I mean you have hundreds of millions probably of species of, of different things on this planet all living here with the plants and the, even just to like for you to breathe and be alive right now there has to be some ingenious balance in your body like all the gene, like all the biology and biochemical reactions and fighting off bacteria and your breathe, like your heart's pumping, your blood, everything. There's so many different variables and things going on. It's inconceivable, yet it's all balanced and you can sit here and breathe and be alive. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. It's almost as if it's a miracle. And so that's a divine balance. And so live in accordance with nature. We want to sort of be uh, trying to find balance and equilibrium in our lives and sort of live from that place. Because if we do that, um, we're going to, I think, live a very prosperous life. Um, if you look at some of the uh, wisest, the most intelligent people, well, for me anyway, these are the kind of mystics, the the visionaries. Well, these people are, they've found a, they, they seem to uh, sort of, project of a real balance within themselves and you know that's hard to do as 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 you experience more your your mind becomes more complex the more ideas you're introduced the more you open up you read different things you learn different things you're going to be uh your mind is going to become more complex and that's why why kind of you know insanity and uh, genius usually come hand in hand because the more complex you become as a human being uh, the more you know the more you understand all this stuff you know, the it kind of drives you into a chaotic state a lot of times. And so the people that can do that and then also find grounding and balance, like we see the universe does, um, they are 
sometimes the most influential people and very wise people and you know people that you really want to get advice from and stuff like that and you want to learn from and people that you kind of want want around and running things and influencing things there they really are amazing people and we should strive to have that kind of balance in our own life and sort of emulate the balance that we see this divine balance in the universe i mean really start to think about it it's incredible and so yeah it's a little take on equilibrium and balance a new perspective on it and how you can sort of integrate it into your own life and think about how you could become more of a balanced individual um i really want to say that you know looking at these ideas like like i'm doing here is very important and I just want to make it clear that these ideas are the foundation. They are the they are the base for modern society. The ideas that we we have in physics, mathematics, uh, these kind of things, logic, all of this, they are the foundation and are the building blocks of our current society and current modern society. And when you independently think about them on your own, don't just accept what you're being told. You think about them. You're going to start to think, see that I don't really know what these things are. What is a force? What is it? Where is it coming from? How can it, everything work together? If you start to think about it independently, you're going to go to places in which you're going to become very uh, knowledgeable about it from, from within yourself rather than just um, doing things questions you're going to be you're going to understand it even possibly to a, i mean i would say definitely to a level higher than the people even teaching it to you i mean ask your teacher what is a force and if they 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 won't know i mean because we don't know i mean i want to be open here i want to be um you know sort of vulnerable and i want to be honest and authentic with you guys and like if i'm being honest we don't understand what these things are we understand how they work but we don't understand what what, what they are and so People like you, intelligent people, we need you to start thinking about it and it will help you in all aspects of your life to think about these ideas because they govern the way you think and the society around you, the modern society. You'll understand yourself better and you'll understand the world that you inhabit better. And so it's a win-win, baby, and you're going to be successful and, and, and things are going to start working for you because if you don't understand things, like truly understand them, how are you going to move through the world? If you don't understand what's going on around you and why it's here and the ideas that govern it, how are you going to move through the world successfully? How are you going to create an influence in positive ways? And so that's really one of the things that I wanted to get across here. Maybe I rambled a little bit too much. Live in accordance with nature. Look at nature and live in accordance with it. We find divine balance in nature. How can we emulate that in our own lives? Because if we live in accordance with nature, nature is intelligent. We live in accordance with it. We're going to be living the best kind of lives and that's what we want uh, for all of us and for you and so yeah please uh like and subscribe to this um i want to say thank you to all the people on patreon who have uh, bought my courses i mean it's doing great on there getting great feedback and so i want to say thank you to all of you um for that support and uh yeah i'll see you when i see you